Hi folks, welcome to this A Minute to Midnight presentation. I want to deal with uh, some of the fallacies around Donald Trump and how he's supposedly fighting against the New World Order and also to deal with some of the, what I believe, are false prophecies that have come uh, promoting Donald Trump into something he isn't. Now, I want to stress that I am not doing this as anti-Trump and I'm not saying that God can't use Donald Trump in many ways. But I do want to make a point of saying that I do not believe Donald Trump is some biblically specially anointed King Cyrus figure as the new apostolic reformation and dominionist prophets have been cracking him up to be. I also want to stress that I am not anti-Israel either, even though I pinpoint some things about the Rothschild family in this video. And we all know that they do have strong connections and ties with Israel, which I need to deal with more in some other videos. But with the information I will bring to you in this video, I think it should prove that Donald Trump has connections that go back to the Rothschild family in one way or another, either directly or indirectly. And really it should leave any thinking person questioning whether Donald Trump is beholden to the Rothschilds and the bankers and the Illuminists, at least at some level in what he is doing. Not saying that everything Donald Trump does is necessarily bad, but this mixture. Now all of a sudden we have a righteous president who's actually doing good and is stopping the New World Order timeline. Because of the anointing. God is really watching over you. And I believe God's put his hand on you as a Cyrus to be a governor and that the Bible talks about this critical 45th chapter is the 45th president. And it's the, it, is the, it is the decisive moment in American history. Here's what I want to tell you. Cyrus gave the command. Build a wall. <laughs> I'm delirious with delight. I'm sure most of you are well aware of Henry Kissinger's ties to the New World Order and to the Rothschilds. I won't spend a lot of time on it here as I've covered it more in previous videos. But let's just have a quick look at Trump and his relationship with Henry Kissinger. But it's an honor to have Henry Kissinger with us. He's been a friend of mine for a long time. Thank you very much. Henry Kissinger has been a friend of mine. I've liked him, I've respected him, but we've been friends for a long time, long before my emergence in the world of politics, which has not been too long. But we have been uh, really in the, new, I guess you'd say the New York seat a little bit, but we got to know each other very well. He's a man I have great, great respect for. So you can clearly see Trump calling Henry Kissinger his friend and that he respects him. The fact that Trump even had Kissinger twice in the White House in these separate videos uh, should be enough to tell you that Trump is not fighting the New World Order, of which Henry Kissinger is a big part of. And let's not forget that Henry Kissinger is the one that introduced Sir Evelyn de Rothschild to his current wife, Lynn Forrester de Rothschild. And he also is well known to have ties with George Soros and other New World Order globalists. There can be no doubt that the Rothschild family wields enormous power and influence in the world. Here is Sir Evelyn de Rothschild poking Prince Charles, the future King of England, in the chest as if he was a naughty schoolboy under his master. You certainly do not do that to a royal unless you are somebody of incredible power and influence. And here we see Evelyn's wife Lynn Forrester de Rothschild communicating with her friend Hillary Clinton and Hillary asked her let me know what penance I owe you when she sidetracked Tony Blair away from a meeting with the de Rothschilds when she had a visit to Israel in the Middle East planned. For Hillary Clinton to be asking for forgiveness from de Rothschild when uh, she had political business would have to lead you to believe that she, in some way at least, was answerable to Lynn Forrester de Rothschild. However, there are many people that seem to want you to believe that the Rothschilds control everything in the world, including elections, and yet that appears to be contradicted in another WikiLeaks leaked email between Clinton and Lynn Forrester de Rothschild because uh, Lynn says to Hillary, I'm back from the unpredictable and exciting election in Britain. 
So if the Rothschilds really controlled elections, then they wouldn't be unpredictable and exciting for them, would they? So I think that just shows you they do not have the amount of power that some people seem to want you to believe that they have, particularly among some members of the so-called truther community and YouTube channelers who would have you believe that the Rothschilds control the whole world. And one of my pet annoyances is even though I try and expose what I can, the truth of the Rothschilds, I get really annoyed when I see fake news and false stories being used to target the Rothschilds um, when really that's all it is, is fake news or at best dubious news. And an example of that would be this article here that was quoted all over the internet and it came from yournewswire.com and it's been repackaged all over the place. And here is what it says. Rothschild demands Western nations invade Syria. Sir Evelyn de Rothschild has urged Western nations to unite as one in order to intervene in Syria and overthrow Assad to usher Syrians into the new century, describing Assad as a brutal dictator who must be brought to heel during a grim speech at a fundraiser in the City of London financial district. Rothschild demanded the Western nations topple the Assad regime because it is resistant to common decency and a threat to our corporate values. Okay, now nowhere in the, that bit or anywhere else in the article is any source listed. There is nowhere where it tells you where the fundraiser was or what the fundraiser was for. And there are no other news sources that have quoted this except for repackaging this um, your Newswire article and then everyone thinks that it's the truth and that uh, Evelyn de Rothschild said that but there is actually no proof that he said that so quite frankly Baxter Dimitri who wrote that article and has included no sources either needs to put some sources and a an origin for the the quote or else this should be treated as fake news and not repackaged everywhere to fit an agenda like so many people on YouTube and other websites have done and they don't seem to care if it's fact or fiction so long as it suits the narrative that that website or YouTube channel itself is pushing. All the talk of uh, people saying that Donald Trump is against the New World Order and against the Rothschilds, well that's just simply not the case and I'm going to show you now looking at a few people including the Blackstone Group and Stephen A. Schwarzman and Jacob Rothschild. The chairman, CEO and co-founder of the Blackstone Group is Stephen Schwarzman. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Business Council, the Business Roundtable and the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum. He is also a member of the Skull and Bones from Yale. Schwarzman has been involved in all phases of Blackstone's development since its founding and the Blackstone Group is one of the world's leading investment firms with $450 billion of assets under management. According to this article by Derek Seidman in January 2018, it says that the Blackstone Group is the biggest private equity firm in the world. Its CEO, Stephen Schwarzman, is one of the most powerful figures on Wall Street and is worth $12.7 billion. Schwarzman has been a central ally and enabler of Donald Trump. In addition to shelling out $250,000 for Trump's inauguration, Swarzman has also served as an advisor to Trump and chaired his strategic and policy forum. The president disbanded the council um, a while back, but... The fact is that Schwarzman has travelled with Trump on Air Force One and stayed with him at Mar-a-Lago. Schwarzman also hosted a $100,000 a plate fundraiser for Trump at his Park Avenue home on December 1st, 2017 to celebrate the Senate's approval of the GOP tax bill. Billionaires who stand to benefit most from the tax plan, like Schwarzman, raised $3 million for Trump at the banquet, where Trump and Schwarzman sat side by side. So you can see that Donald Trump and Stephen Schwarzman are very close. In fact, they've been longtime friends. 
this article from the International Business Times in December last year says tax bill adds new deduction for Blackstone CEO and GOP donor Schwartzman. And if you go down the into the story, you'll see just weeks before the election last year, billionaire Stephen Schwartzman gave $2.57 million to the Senate Leadership Fund, a super PAC that supports Republican Senate candidates. Now he's poised to see a huge return on that investment. I find this really interesting. Here's a Market Watch article. Blackstone CEO throws himself a party of the century, complete with Camels and Gwen Stefani. Guests were reportedly led to a Ted Stadium for fireworks and a three-storey temple for dinner, all for over 10 million, and some reports say up to 20 million. Schwarzman, who this is back in 2017, remember, is President Trump's economic advisor, was feted by 400 guests at the epic Silk Road themed bash, rumoured to have cost over 10 million. Okay, now we'll look at the guests. Trump skipped this lavish affair because his security would have overwhelmed the party, we're told. They worked for a year on the party and spent six weeks building a movie set. It really was the party of the century. But we can see in another article here that Donald Trump and Melania Trump were there in 2007 at his 60th birthday, this one being the 70th birthday. So let's look at some of the people who actually were there. Well, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump were there. Stephen Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, was there, along with Wilbur Ross, who we will be looking at shortly as well, and Ronald Lauder from Estee Lauder, and Lord Jacob Rothschild. Just before I look at Jacob Rothschild, I just want to remind people that Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, the wife of Sir Evelyn de Rothschild, is a director at Estee Lauder. We shall now see that Jacob Rothschild has long-standing and deep associations with Blackstone and Stephen Schwartzman. Jacob Rothschild is a part of the Blackstone Group's International Advisory Board, but even further back than that, we can see in this article here in 2008 that Blackstone said that Lord Jacob Rothschild is stepping down from its board of directors. It has been a distinct honour and privilege for us to have Jacob on the board of directors and we've benefited from his wide range of banking knowledge and many years of experience and we owe him a great deal of thanks for his valuable contribution. We regret his stepping down from the board of directors but we are delighted to have the continued benefit of his counsel as he has accepted our invitation to serve on our International Advisory Board. So Jacob Rothschild was actually on the board of directors at one point for Blackstone. So you can see a deep association there between Jacob Rothschild and Stephen Schwartzman. We can see in an article here, private equity firm Blackstone to buy Gramercy Property Trust for $7.6 billion. That's from May this year. And Gramercy owns 362 properties worth about $80 million. Major rental home companies set to merge as U.S. house prices recover. This is from August last year. Invitation Homes is majority owned by the Blackstone Group, one of the first private equity firms to begin buying foreclosed homes in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, fixing them up and renting them out. Two institutional landlords, that's Invitation Homes, which is a, you know the giant business of the Blackstone Group, and Starwood Waypoint Homes would be combining to create an entity with about 82,000 homes in more than a dozen big markets. The combined company will operate as Invitation Homes and will trade under the Invitation Homes ticker symbol. The Blackstone Group actually profited big time from the last financial crisis and put themselves into a position where they own a substantial part of the rental market. In CNBC, this article in January 2017, governments Fannie Mae will back uh, Blackstone's rental home debt. Mortgage giant Fannie Mae 
is getting into single family rental business in a big way. The government backed agency said it is going into business with private equity giant and major housing player Blackstone by backing $1 billion in debt. Blackstone's Invitation Homes filed for an initial public offering this week and the Fannie Mae relationship was disclosed afterward. Blackstone is looking to raise $1.6 billion by selling shares to the public. Fannie Mae, currently under government conservatorship, will back $1 billion in debt collateralized by rental homes owned by Blackstone. Now, if you remember back to the uh, initial Illuminati tenement where part of the plan was the abolition of private property and Karl Marx basically parroted the same thing in the Communist Manifesto. Just think about another financial crisis. What's going to happen in that situation? You have Fannie Mae and Blackstone combining and remember after the last one how they bought up all sorts of properties uh, from foreclosed homes. Do we see a possible uh, tie-up here for the next financial crisis? And particularly remembering that also Jacob Rothschild has an involvement with Blackstone. At the end of last year and early this year, I did a series of six videos on the New World Order. If you haven't seen that series, I think it would be good if you go back and watch them, particularly in light of this video, watch the first one from December 14th, 2017 called New World Order Coming to a Town Near You. I'm going to replay a little piece of that now and you will see why it ties up with this video. It is also no coincidence that the Rothschilds have an affinity and an association with the ancient symbols of the all-seeing eye and the pyramid. So we're working not only on a big flagship project, we do those very occasionally, like the Supreme Court. Jacob Rothschild was of course referring to the Israel Supreme Court, which the Rothschilds family agreed to donate the building under three conditions, that they were to choose the plot of land, they were to choose their own architect, and no one would even know the price of the construction. And it is very obviously full of Illuminati symbolism. Uh, too much to talk about here, except you will notice immediately the pyramid with the eye in it is a prominent feature of the Israeli Supreme Court. I want to state categorically here that I do fully believe in Israel's right to exist. I'm not anti-Israel. I do also believe that it is by the divine hand of God that Israel is what it is today with Jews predominantly living there. I believe that it was by divine appointment that the Jews were gathered from the four corners of the earth back to the land that is known today again as Israel. But I'm also aware that along with the wheat as Jesus said, there will be tears that grow amongst the wheat and we have them throughout the formation of the State of Israel, even though I also believe in the right of Israel to choose Jerusalem as its capital. But nevertheless, you cannot deny the fact that the Rothschilds and their money played a large role in the formation of Israel and still plays a role today. And as Jesus said, the tears will grow up with the wheat. I know how proud you are to be Jewish. Yes. I know how Zionist you are. Right. And we now have 45 people in Jerusalem and um, a large number of projects, including the um, project which I've been now working on for 15 years, which is uh, the new National Library in Israel. I mean, half of my family were very against um, the idea of the uh, home of the Jewish people in Palestine. And um, the other half were for it. Now, that situation will never go away. Did you notice how Jacob Rothschild mentioned the National Library of Israel? Well, look, here is an article uh, the lot from the librarians. The National Library of Israel receives major gift from, you guessed it, Stephen A. Schwarzman for new landmark building in Jerusalem. A major gift from Stephen A. Schwarzman will establish the Stephen A. Schwarzman Education Centre 
in the new National Library of Israel campus currently under construction in Jerusalem. This is from February this year. The National Library of Israel has announced a major gift from Stephen Schwarzman. Stephen A. Schwarzman, Chairman, CEO and Co-Founder of Blackstone, is a renowned philanthropist with a history of supporting transformational education programs. In 2013, Schwarzman established Schwarzman Scholars, a highly selective one-year master's program at a university in Beijing, which I can't pronounce. Other major gifts have included a student centre and performing arts hub at Yale University and the transformation of the New York Public Library's main branch. The 3,900 square foot Stephen A. Schwarzman Education Centre at the National Library of Israel will include a multi-purpose space with capacity of 100 people for classes, lectures, performance and more. The new National Library of Israel building has been made possible through the generosity of the Rothschild family, the David S. and Ruth L. Gottesman family of New York and the Israeli government. A quote from Stephen Schwarzman, My hope is that the Stephen A. Schwarzman Education Centre will serve as a crossroads for its new campus, bringing together future generations of students from around the world and creating a hub for cutting-edge innovation in education. Now, more than ever, our focus must be on fostering cross-cultural relationships. I'm pleased to support the National Library of Israel as it furthers this mission by sharing artefacts and resources from Jewish, Muslim and Christian history and encouraging deep cultural understanding. Now here's one from Jacob Rothschild. I couldn't be more delighted that Steve Schwarzman has decided to establish the Stephen A. Schwarzman Education Centre in our new National Library of Israel building. It is a truly great project and I am happy indeed that Steve's name will be there. With a wide range of cultural, educational and technological initiatives, the National Library will attract new audiences connect Jewish communities throughout the world as well as carry on its principal function of being the preeminent library not only to Israel and Jewish communities worldwide but in addition to all faiths. Notice how both Rothschild and Schwarzman stressed the interfaith part of this. See it's not about a Jewish supremacist sort of Zionism that people seem to think. This is about world government and a global religion that will unite all religions into a false religion under the Antichrist which is coming. So let's get the facts right. It is not just a Jewish conspiracy. Ultimately it's a Luciferian conspiracy. I'm going to play another small section from the video from last December, New World Order Coming to a Town Near You 2018. Well, I know to uh, Rothschild, unity is very important. It is important, but unity is a difficult word. I mean, they have now a whole range of businesses, some of which compete with one another, but they have cross interests. So we work it out. Remember earlier I spoke of Hegelian dialectic and the setting up of opposites? Two that are often quoted as being opposite are Donald Trump and George Soros, and yet we find that they have actually had considerable financial dealings. Here is an interesting article on a website called The Infinite Unknown, which has uncovered a lot of information on the Trump and Soros dealings. Why did George Soros forgive Donald Trump as much as $312 million in debt for no apparent reason? Why would Soros give what amounts to a massive debt relief to Trump during a financially successful period in Trump's life? Are these men friends, enemies or business partners? And I would like to add, remember the Hegelian dialectic? Are they actually opposites or are they just being portrayed as opposites? Okay, now let's look back to an article in the Chicago Tribune, uh, October 28th, 2004. Big names back Trump Tower. Donald Trump has lined up 
three New York hedge funds, including money from billionaire George Soros, to invest $160 million in his Chicago skyscraper, a key piece and perhaps the largest construction financing in the city's history, according to real estate sources and public documents. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this next bit, but you can do more research for yourselves. Resorts International was a hotel and casino company that, after the death of longtime chairman James Crosby in 1986, the company was briefly controlled by Donald Trump. One of the Resorts International projects that Trump was involved in was the Taj Mahal, which budget ballooned out to $930 million and Resorts struggled to find financing to complete it and the company nearly went bankrupt when, wherein Trump made a tender offer to buy all the outstanding stock. Trump said he advised the resorts board that he was making the offer as a result of the resorts' inability to obtain financing to complete the Taj Mahal Casino, which was in Atlanta City, New Jersey. Fast forward to 1992, and the Trump organisation was in financial trouble, and Stephen Bollenbach, who was one of Trump's top advisors, resigned. This is February 11th, 1992. The resignation marked the latest management departure from the Trump organization. Bollenbach, who became Trump's chief financial officer in early 1990, as the developers' businesses were showing signs, serious signs of crumbling, he's returning to Marriott Corporation. Trump said in a statement from his Manhattan headquarters that Bollenbach agreed in July, in July that he would leave when Trump, the Trump group reached a comprehensive agreement with banks and other lenders. Trump said Bollenbach wanted to stay through the completion of documentation which finalised those agreements. At that point, Trump owed $3.3 billion to the banks. And who are those banks? Rothschild banks. And this next bit is a Washington Post from 1994. Wilbur Ross Jr., Senior Managing Director of Rothschild Incorporated, a New York investment banking firm, said, for instance, that while he is very uncomfortable with Marriott's treatment of its bondholders, Bollenbach does not cross the borderline to mis- misrepresentation or defrauding people and things of that sort, whereas there are people in his side of the business world that come closer to doing that. Ross, who a few years ago represented bondholders on the other side of the negotiating table from Bollenbach, when Bollenbach was working to save Donald Trump from bankruptcy, said Bollenbach is a very strong adversary and very difficult to deal with, yet they remain on friendly terms, Ross said. So there you have it. Rothschild Incorporated was the bank, and Wilbur Ross was entrusted with the role of sorting that out and negotiating with Bollenbach. And what is Wilbur Ross doing today? Well, he is currently the United States Secretary of Commerce, announced on November 30th, 2016 by President Donald Trump and sworn into office on February 28th, 2017. He was also with Donald Trump on his visit to Saudi Arabia in 2017. And let's not forget that Uh, Stephen Schwarzman also has major interests in Saudi Arabia and in financing Mohammed bin Salman's Neom city. Let's not forget that Stephen Mnuchin, who is the Secretary of Treasury under Trump, was formerly a partner at Goldman Sachs and also was initiated into the Skull and Bones in 1985. And, of course, we've also seen that Stephen Schwarzman was initiated into the skull and bones as well. And for those people that are expecting Donald Trump to lock up Hillary Clinton, let's not forget the 60 Minutes message that he delivered in an interview when he said, I don't want to hurt them, referring to the Clintons. They're good people. And my goal here is not really to be coming across as either anti-Trump or pro-Trump or anti anything really apart from the fact that I am anti people pushing a silly narrative that Trump is fighting against the new world order when all the facts show that is not the case and also I 
think that the biblicizing of Trump and giving him some sort of King Cyrus mantle and almost putting him in a position of being in the Bible is just ludicrous and leading people up the garden path. Lord said, turn to Isaiah 45. So I go to Isaiah, I told Trump the story today. So I go to Isaiah 45, and I didn't know if it was going to be a rebuke or a blessing. I was, didn't know what the chapter was. And here's what I read to Mr. Trump. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held to subdue nations. I will go before you and make crooked places straight. Donald Trump's got this, like, Elijah mantle on him. He's got the Cyrus anointing. And I'm reminded here of a scripture in Isaiah chapter 30, and that is verse 9 to 10. It says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. And also 2 Timothy 4.3 tells us that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after your own lusts will heap for themselves teachers having itching ears. So I think there's a certain amount of that with these uh, false prophecies regarding Trump. By all means, pray for Donald Trump and his family. Pray also for the peace of Jerusalem. But remember that we do live in an age of great deception and also the time of Jacob's trouble. The great tribulation is ahead of us, so all is not going to run smoothly and no politician is going to be able to alter God's end time timeline. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. There's a lot more I have I can offer in another follow-up video soon. Don't forget to hit the like button and also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Remember, A Minute to Midnight, our website is where you can find all of our shows and our videos. And we do run A Minute to Midnight 100% by donations. If you uh, want to help us out, that would be greatly appreciated. And you can easily do that on our website. There's a donation page. This is Tony for a minute to midnight.com signing off.